You're watching the GMA Summer Series on Network 10 and Associated Stations. Over the years, there have been many people claiming to have known Elvis, Elvis Presley. But my next guest is one who not only knew Elvis, but played alongside him. The man is Elvis's own personal drummer, DJ Fontana. And I asked DJ if he realised all those years ago, when Elvis was in his teens, that he was going to make it big. You can almost tell, uh, you know, he was a very handsome guy, even at 18 and 19 years old. He's a nice looking kid. I call him a kid, you know. Uh, but he had that certain charisma, you know, he could get the people on his side. And that's the important thing, I think, mm -hmm. you know, even with the songs he was doing, he, he knew how to attract the people. And of course, there was nobody quite like him before. And I would suggest no one has been quite like him since, have they? I haven't seen anyone yet. Uh, it, it's. Uh, it's kind of hard, to, and I, I know a lot of the big artists now, and they said that, uh, you know, they was not artists until they saw Elvis work mm -hmm. and, and heard his records, so they decided they wanted to become singers and whatever, you know. They'd been before him showmen, and they'd been fine singers. He combined both, and also, I think he was the first performer, in my lifetime anyway, that really went after the youth market. And then eventually, everybody else grew along with them. Well, that's what happened uh, uh, when we first started. Uh, it was an older crowd that used to come to the venues, but then they'd go home and tell their kids about them. Mm. And that's how it really got started. It was just a snowball effect that uh, kept snowballing with the young kids. You know. Did he enjoy his success? Oh, DJ? sure he did. You have to, you know, airplanes and big houses and big cars. I would too, you know. Yeah, he, but he had a great time, and he gave away a lot of things. You know, he gave away cars and houses and, and monies. You know, he, he, he gave a lot of money to charities all the time. So, yeah, he enjoyed it. A lot of people try and paint the picture that for most of his life, certainly in the spotlight, that he was, he was on a downer for most of the time, and that just doesn't appear to be true. No, I, I never saw him unhappy, actually. Uh, when he did get unhappy, it was around the time that him and Priscilla broke up, you mm -hmm. know? I was going to ask you, she was pretty important to him. Oh, yeah, she? they were, of course, husband and wives and all that stuff, but they're also good friends, because I talked to him about it later, and, and uh, it, when he would get in trouble, he thought he was in trouble with some kind of was bothering him, well, he'd jump on his jet and fly to California. And they'd sit down, talk four or five hours, and he was happy. He'd come back to Memphis. So. This is even after the separation? Yeah, they were separated and divorced, actually, mm. but he would fly out and see them, and... And, and, and just sort of chew the fat? Just chew the fat yeah. and see what she thought about this idea and that idea. She was... How did you come into his life, or how did he come into your life? Well, it was down in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, there was a show called the, Grand, uh, the Louisiana Hayride, actually. And uh, it was like the Grand Ole Opry is today. Yeah. And uh, I was just happened to be there by accident. I was on the, the house band, so-called house band. And uh, they asked me to work with them. I said, sure. And they asked me if they'd come back two or three weeks later. And, in a row, and I said, yeah, 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 we'll do it. And then they said, well, we're going to go here to Texas and do some more work. Would you want to go with us four days? I said, sure. Got back to uh, Shreveport, and he said, well, now we're going to go home. We hadn't got a date booked forever. Mm -hmm. We may never get another date. He said, but would you work with us if, in fact, we did? I said, be happy to. So it was kind of a gradual uh, thing that happened, you know. And was he intelligent musically? Yeah, his ear was really keen. You know, he almost had perfect pitch, actually. And he, he, he played enough instruments to be dangerous. You know, he played a little guitar, a little bass, a little piano, a little organ, little drums. So he could explain to you what he wanted. And if he, if he wasn't clear, he'd sit down and show you what he wanted. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he was, he was very good at it. Did he have much control over his career, or Colonel Parker looked after him? Well, he had all things? the control in the studios. What, artistically? Yeah, he did it all. He, he chose his tunes. Uh, he chose the arrangements that he wanted. He, he would tell us what he wanted. The colonel took over all the business. They had a deal. You do the business, and I'll do the performance. But leave us alone. And, and he did. Colonel F. And it worked. Alone. It worked for mm -hmm. them, sure. Because some blame is now put on, on Colonel Parker, isn't it? Well, a lot of blame is put on that guy, you know. And, and uh, I didn't really like the guy, <laughs> to tell you the truth. But uh, you, I had to give him credit. I, I thought about it and thought about it after all these years. And, you know, it's hard to keep an artist up for five years. Yeah. Yeah. And he kept this guy going for 40 years. Mm. DJ Fontana on Life with a Legend.